Hi everyone, thank you for joining me today. My name's Louise and our lesson today is all about animal classification. So every animal and in fact every living thing that has ever existed can be classified and there's a whole science behind this. So it's actually called taxonomy in case you might have heard that word before and the scientists which do this work, which classify all the living things, are called taxonomists. So today is just a short introduction to this topic so after after we're finished you should be able to go away and classify all of your favorite animals or living things and find out their scientific name so all the animals that we know in our day-to-day -day speech dog lion cat they all have different scientific names that are used within the scientific community so how did animal classification begin well, back in the 18th century, there was a Swedish man called Carolus Linnaeus, and he thought it was really important that we be able to organise living things. So he developed a system to do just that. He started out interested in plants, but he ended up ordering all life as he knew it, and that's how the system developed. We still use the essence of his system from way back in the 18th century today, which is really impressive. Clearly, his scientific method was very solid. The only thing is scientists are constantly refining it today based on new knowledge. So it has adapted and changed a little bit since when Linnaeus first invented it. So let's have a look at his system. So there are seven levels of classification. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And this system works for every living thing on the planet down to the most microscopic creature you can imagine. We can classify them with this system. If it helps, I've just got a mnemonic phrase for you here. There are lots and lots. I just chose this one. It's the one that I use to help me remember because I think it's a little bit funny. King Philip, come out for goodness sake. You can use that to help you remember kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And that's the way we go down. So the levels, as you can see on the triangle, they start out broadly at the top. This means that the top levels have the most living things in its class. And then they get narrower and narrower as you go down. So by the time we get all the way down to the bottom to species, there's really only just one animal in that group. Sometimes we have species and subspecies, but you can generally think that when we get down to species that's one living thing there and we have identified it so yeah imagining it as an upside down triangle is quite helpful okay so let's have a look at our first level the kingdoms Generally, scientists agree that there are six kingdoms. When Linnaeus first developed his system, he only had two kingdoms, plants and animals, but the use of the microscope after that led to the discovery of new organism organisms and the identification of differences in cells and really tiny, tiny living things, uh, which is why we now have today's six kingdoms. A too long a kingdom system was no longer useful. We found so many more living things which we needed to classify. Some scientists today actually think that viruses, um, like obviously the one we're dealing with right now, should have their own kingdom, but currently that's not accepted in the scientific community by everyone. We'll see if that changes in the coming years. Okay, so first of all, we have the animal kingdom. That's the one we're mainly focusing on today because it's the one that we are familiar with the most. And it's the largest kingdom with over 1 million known species. And obviously we have not discovered all of the species that there are to discover. We're still discovering them today. The next one we have is plants. Again, you're probably familiar with what plants are. This includes flowering plants, mosses and ferns. And plants can, if you've done any plant science, you will already know, they can make their own food. Which brings us on to fungi. That's kind of mushrooms like you see in the picture. Mushrooms, mould and mildew. The important difference between fungi and plants is that fungi cannot make their own food. They have to get their food from parts of plants that are already decaying in the soil. So they basically feed off plants which are already dead. As we all know, some fungi taste great, especially on pizza, things like that, but others can be deadly poisonous. So that's one reason, that brings us to our first reason, why it's important to classify things. If we're going to be eating these plants and these fungi, we want to know which one of them might be harmful to us. So there's your first reason. Okay, next we're going to go to archaea bacteria. So these are one cell 
organisms. So any complex animals, plants, fungi have millions, billions of cells in them. These are one cell organisms, so you're only going to see them through a microscope. Archaebacteria are only found in extreme environments like hot boiling water. They were originally found from a spot really deep in the Pacific Ocean where there's hot gases and molten rock which boiled into the ocean from the Earth's interior. So we're not seeing these in kind of day-to-day -day life, only in very extreme conditions. That brings us next to eubacteria, which Again, single cell bacteria, you're only going to see them with a microscope because they're tiny, tiny, tiny. But they are found pretty much everywhere. So these are the bacteria that we're kind of familiar with. Uh, some of them are helpful for producing vitamins, for making food like yogurt. Other ones, a bacteria can cause disease. So these are the ones that you've probably heard of, we've spoken about. The next one then, the final one, is protists. These are generally slime, moulds, algae, all the nice ones. Um, so this is sometimes called the odds and ends kingdom because its members are actually really different from one another, even though they're tiny. Um, they're all microscopic organisms which are not bacteria, animals, plants, or fungi. So it's basically all of the organisms which are not the other five, okay? So that's why it's kind of the odds and ends kingdom. So, going back to our seven levels, we come next to phylum. Phylum is the plural, phyla with an A is the singular version. So, thinking about our animal kingdom, we currently think there's about ten phylum. So, just to pick out a few, we've got phylum chordata. That's the one that is most animals because it's humans and all animals with a backbone. So, you can see that the word chordata looks a little bit like the word cord, like backbone, spinal cord. Um, so, we are going to talk a little bit about etymology today that's kind of the science of the words because a lot of the words we see will be familiar to you um, in these scientific names so we've got phylum chordata we also have phylum arthropoda and that is actually the largest group in the animal kingdom because it contains most of the insects spiders and other animals with kind of segmented bodies like shrimp you know how shrimp have kind of their head separately their body and then their tail um they're in that phylum and they generally have their skeletons on the outside of their body and other characteristics in common like that so when we think of our examples, we're generally today going through kingdom animalia, the animal kingdom, and then phylum chordata with a backbone. Okay, so moving down the triangle, we come next to class. So as we're working down our upside down triangle through the ranks, the animals or living things in each group become more and more alike. So by the time we get to a class, they generally are starting to share a lot of characteristics. So for example, um, one class would be class mammalia, so mammals, and they, for example, all have hair and are warm-blooded. And yes, even whales and dolphins, which are mammals, do have hair, um, although it's sometimes only present on the very young ones, on the babies. Other classes that we have are the aves, that's birds, and reptilia, reptiles. So if we just take a look at that word aves, for example, birds, going back to our etymology, the science of the words, um, if it may, might make you think about some words like aviation, aviary, Aviary is where birds live, if, for example, you go to a zoo. Uh, so those words all come from this stem, aves, which generally goes way back to the Latin. Okay, so next we're moving down to orders. And again, getting down into smaller groups, they're becoming more and more similar. So just to give you some examples, carnivora is the order um, of mammals which have the same meat-eating ancestors. So any meat-eating animal is in the carnivora order, as long as it has a backbone. Um, we also have Arteodactyla, and yes, some of the names are very difficult to say, so don't worry. Generally, if you're not in the scientific community, you're going to be reading them and not saying them very often. But this order is herbivorous mammals, so that's mammals which don't eat meat. For example, pigs, deer, hippos, and cattle. Okay, so moving down to our next level is family. So when we get to this rank, sometimes in the scientific community, there is even disagreement about which family an animal belongs to. So the animals are really starting to be similar, really starting to share a lot of characteristics. Um, so, for example, we have Felidae, that's the cat family. Canidae is the dog family. Hominidae is the family which humans come from, that's the great ape family. Corvidae is the crow 
crow family and Delphinidae is the dolphin family. So obviously, again, you should be able to recognize Delphinidae, dolphin, corvidae, crow. They're quite similar. Um, and the members of the cat family are, for example, more closely related to each other than they are to the members of the dog family. So that's how all of this classification is working. Next, we come down to genus, the second to last rank. This might sometimes only have one or two animals in it. Sometimes it'll be a bigger group. If we're down to this same genus, they are really closely related now. And in fact, you might not even be able to tell these animals apart just by looking at them. At them. It might take a scientist to tell you how these animals within a genus are different from each other. The genus to which an, an, an organism or an animal belongs to makes up the first part of their scientific name. And importantly, if you're trying to be scientifically rigorous, when we write their scientific name, there's a specific way to do it. So the genus is written in italics and with the first letter capitalised. As you can see, these genus on the screen that I've written. So Canis is a part of the dog family and that's where we get the genus of dogs and wolves as well. We're going to see that later. Rat Rattus is an example, obviously the rat family. Um, homo, like Homo sapiens, that's obviously human beings. So how you write our scientific name is Homo italicized with a capital H and then sapiens, which we will see when we come to species. So moving on to species, this is if an animal can breed together successfully, so if they can create children together, that means they are within a species. And when an animal is called by its scientific name, so we have the genus, the first letter, italicized, capitalized, and the species, the second word, italicized and not capitalized. So the example I just gave, homo sapien, two words, genus, species, both italicized, the first one capitalized. So that's important if you're wanting to write any scientific names. Okay, so as I said before, sometimes species can go into subspecies, but they must still be able to breed together, so to make children together. Uh, sometimes they'll have slight differences, maybe for example, different breeds of dog. They're all the species dog, but they're different breeds, they're kind of subspecies, but they can breed together. Okay, so looking at this table, we have some examples here. Um, and we should, with our knowledge, be able to say the scientific name of any of these animals. So the last two columns are just genus, species. Sorry, we can't see them there. Uh, for example, you should be able to, with your new knowledge, tell me that the scientific name of a horse is Equus caballus or caballus. Okay, so now you should really be able to go away and classify any of your favourite animals. You can go to a website called animaldiversity.org and if you put in the search box your favourite animal, it will bring up all of its animal classification like this. So this is certainly not my favourite animal, but it's a good example. So a normal house rat, if we go down the kingdom animalia, the phylum chordata, meaning spinal bone, there is a subphylum here. We do have subphylums, but we're not going into those today. Um, it's just kind of another classification level, which you don't need to use. Uh, we then have class mammalia, order rodentia, like rodents, family muridae, and this website is great because it gives you a little bit of an explanation. So this is an old word for mice, rats, gerbils and relatives of them. The genus is Rattus and the species is also Rattus. So I like this example because a normal house rat, the scientific name is Rattus Rattus. Another thing you can do on this website is use it to help you find animals which are very similar to yours. So you can see which animals might be similar and very closely related to a rat. So we're going to work through another example together. This is the grey wolf. So again, obviously, kingdom animalia, phylum chordata, you should know this by now, class mammalia, um, it's warm-blooded and it has hair, order carnivora, its uh, ancestors are meat-eating and it's still meat-eating today. It's from the family Canidae, if you've been paying attention and you remember, that is the dog family. Its genus is Canis. This genus, as you can see, also includes wolves, other types of wolves, jackals and coyotes. And its species of a grey wolf is Canis lupus. So lupus is a species, scientific name, Canis lupus. So for any of you who are Harry Potter fans, the word lupus might ring a bit of a bell for you with the character Lupin. Spoiler alert, 
Um, he's a werewolf, so you can see some of the etymology again. That actually comes from the Latin word for wolf was lupin. Lupus, lupin, they're very similar. Okay, so you might be wondering, why is all this important? Why does it matter? Why do we need to give a scientific name to animals? It might seem like a little bit of a waste of time. It's very convoluted to go all the way down, kingdom, phylum, class, you know. There are reasons for this. So first of all, it allows scientists to organise huge amounts of knowledge and information. If we were just describing loads of different organisms, it would create an unmanageable and pretty useless mountain of information. You know, if we weren't able to accurately give a scientific name which only identifies this one animal, um, it would be very difficult to communicate and to handle such quantities of information. Taxonomy also allows them to make predictions and frame hypotheses about different organisms. So if I can classify this animal and I know that it's actually very closely related to the rat, maybe it's in the same genus as the house rat, I can make predictions about how this animal is likely going to behave, about its body, about its functions. So it really helps us to understand what the world and make predictions about the animals that we know. It also facilitates scientific communication. So because all these organisms have very precise names and are in precise groups, it really helps us to talk about them in the scientific community. So if I'm just going to say rat, and if I were a scientist, other people wouldn't really know what I was talking about. Am I talking about a house rat, a brown rat, an Australian swamp rat, or an Indian giant squirrel, which is also in the rat family? As I said before, it's also important to know if things are dangerous to eat or it has important medical properties or it creates a certain pest for us. We need to be able to communicate that and we can do that by knowing exactly what we are talking about. Another reason that taxonomy is important is for evolution and for understanding evolution because by finding out how animals are related to each other, it helps us to work out how species have evolved. So it's just like making a massive family tree which stretches back over millions and millions of years, right back to when life on earth was nothing more than a few single-celled organisms just floating about in the sea. So what do I mean by this? How does this help us figure out evolution? So for example, we know mammals and insects are very different animals. We can look at them and we know that they're very different. Sometimes though the differences aren't so obvious. So crocodiles and alligators, I don't know about you, but if I looked at them, I'm not expert enough to tell you what's a crocodile and what's an alligator. They look similar, but they are actually in different families. Sometimes as well, similarities between species can be even more misleading. So if you think of a dolphin and a shark, both of them live in the sea, both of them eat fish, and they look pretty similar. You know, they've got a tail, they've got fins, but a dolphin is a mammal and a shark is a fish. By classifying these animals in this way, it actually helped us to discover that all of the shark's ancestors have always lived in the sea, whereas a dolphin's ancestors left the sea, evolved into mammals, and then returned to the sea, which is really cool. But if we hadn't studied and classified mammals and fish, we would never have been able to have discovered that. So that hopefully has taught you why this process of naming animals is actually very important, even if it might seem a little convoluted. So finally, I just wanted to say that the animal classification or taxonomy is constantly changing when we're using discovering new animals, new organisms, and we are discovering more sophisticated scientific methods to identify the relationships between species. So sometimes a species might change group, it might change family or genus, and we might put it in a new place. And sometimes new species are identified through our taxonomy as well. So for example, for many years, elephants were just classified into two species. We had African elephants and Asian elephants. But then in 2010, DNA tests on African elephant, elephants revealed that they are actually two different species there so we have the African bush elephants and the African forest elephants so this helped us to discover that there are actually three species of elephant that we can be aware of so I hope this has been useful if any of you are studying this in science I know it is still on the GCSE science syllabus um, so feel free to recap this video if you found it helpful so thank you very much for listening and hopefully I will see you in another lesson thank you see you